Um, this is Elizabeth McCauley on Wednesday, January 5th, 2011, at about 3 p.m., interviewing um, Robert Kackner. Um, Are you in relation to, uh, to Macaulay's? Um, what the heck is the guy's name? Bob Macaulay. He's my grandfather. Yeah, yes, he's a great guy. I know him. <laughs> he do? Well, I've known him since I was a little boy. Oh, really? He passed when I was um, just about a year old, so I don't really have a memory of him. Um, but yeah, pretty good family. You related then to uh, Rachel? Quackenbush. Probably. I'm not sure. I think she was a Macaulay. Probably. There are a lot of us. It was a Macaulay girl. We went on a trip up to, uh, to um, I think it might have been Rouse's mm -hmm. And Macaulay girl was sick on a bus and I got out. So we got out and I held her head while she York all over. Okay, so what else can I tell you? <laughs> probably, you probably know a lot about my, my family than I do. No, um, I wouldn't say that, but I do know Bob O'Toole, and I know Rachel Quackenbush. Yeah. All right, so if you could just please um, tell me your name and date of birth. My name is Robert Cacketer, C-A-C-K-E-N-E-R. I was born on March 20. 1924. Okay. And what was your rank while you were in the while you were in the army? I was private. Private. Okay. It's a long story why I never made anything else except private. And I'm not sure that the, that needs to be publicized. Okay. Well, whatever you know, whatever you want to say is is fine. Um. So when did you when did you learn? I enlisted, but they wouldn't take me because I couldn't see. I was drafted in March 1943. So you were drafted in, where did you, where was your first assignment to go to? My first assignment really was Brooklyn Navy Base. But I was in the Army. They were fitting her hospital ship up to um, bring wounded back. And we did take people over, too. It was an old honeymoon boat on the Arcadia. And originally it had been used for people to walk along the coast and on their honeymoon. It was flat bottom. So it rocked a lot. And the more it rocked, the more I threw up. <laughs> I remember getting in the head with a ball bat when I was young and it's, I get dizzy this way. So I went on the Army Hospital in Shepacadia. That's part of the reason why I was a was a buck private the rest of the time I was in. I was so sick on the boat that I was useless to anybody. Right. Now they always take the worst man in the outfit and give him to the chaplain. And I was the chaplain. Assistant. You know, see, the chaplain's assistant is usually. I worked with chaplain. I liked him. I liked him. He taught me to play cribbage. We used to play cribbage a lot. Every time I get my cards, I put them down like this under the edge of the table. I go, Keep your hands about the table. <laughs> How long were you on the, the, the medical ship for? I was on the, on the ship just about a year. I got back and I was assigned to the uh, Army Depot in Charleston, South Carolina. And I worked in the, the dispensary most of the time. We got the war kind of tweeted down. Um, I worked in the kitchen a while. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's KP, it's place is hard work. Mm -hmm. So the, that's all out in the yard one day, and everybody that was left, they were all shipping out. Does anybody in here know anything about cooking? I, I'm your man. And my father is a butcher. You know, 
My father never saw a butcher shop in his life. I said, well, we would like to have lamb shoulders with uh, stuffing on them. So I opened the lamb shoulder like you would operate on it, like I opened it up and cut it, the inside of the bone, I took the bone out and filled it up with dressing and bake it. And the medicine said, I've never seen lamb shoulders, stuff like that before. I said, you haven't? Because we do that all that time at home. Fake. There you go. Introduce him to something different. Well, it was interesting because I had to go in about 6 o'clock in the morning and cut the meat for the rest of the day. And things like pork chops and hamburger, that all came in frozen. So all I had to do was take it out of the box and do what we were going to do with it. Right. So um, when, did you, when did you go over to Africa? Uh, in March of 1943. And how long were you stationed there? I was on the boat. Oh, you were still On the hospital there. ship. We went over and we would get a load of those wounded and bring them back to the States. We stayed until we'd get the ship ready again and go back over and get another load. We did that uh, three times, I think. We brought them back to the uh, General Hospital in um, uh, the island in New York City. Uh, Long Island? Staten Island. Staten Island. They had a big army hospital there. And you were there for, was it just one year or? Well, Geraldson, you know, I was there for about two years. Okay. And were you, were you always on KP when you were in Charleston? No, I was never on KP in Charleston. Oh, in Charleston, I'm sorry, that's right. Uh, what, so what did you do when you were in Charleston? I worked in the dispensary. The dispensary, that's right, I'm sorry. Take care of sick people mm -hmm. on a first aid basis. And once in a while somebody cut themselves, they come in and put a few stitches in. It's easier than it looks, and it's also harder than it looks. Is if you don't, if you're not careful, you put the stitch in too tight and it'll butter it, butter the scar. No, I did that. Now, the reason I put me in the med medical corps in the first place is I was a first aid teacher before I went in. Okay. So, what kind of education did you have before before the war? High school. High school. And then did you, you didn't go to college or, or anything for, for medical, for a medical degree? Just learn through the Army? I was a first aid instructor, which I learned right here in Glebsville. And then I went to college later, and I got out of the service, mercifully. So you said you learned everything right here in Glens Falls. Um, and do you remember a lot about your childhood? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, what? Yeah. Well, that's great. No, I was just um, wondering uh, what it was like for you to grow up um, during the Depression. Um, things were a little close. You know, my mother and dad most were. Um, I don't know. Um, my mother and dad both worked, and they, they were My mother worked in the bag factory. And my father worked in the, well, the preparation of the paper to be cut up into paper bags. They, he was on what was called a calendar. And the paper goes through and it goes over a, a very slick roll and it polishes the paper on one side. It's a pretty ordinary job. Yeah. We never, neither my mother and dad graduated from high school. Um, it wasn't bad. Well the, well, the depression was on. We had pretty much anything we wanted as far as food is concerned. And we always had a car, not a new car, but uh, and a lot of traveling around. Uh, my mother was from Indian Lake, and so we she had a lot of friends up there, and we would go up there and visit her friends. 
Do you have any brothers or sisters? I have one brother. In fact, I just talked to him a few minutes ago. Oh, really? And he's 22 years younger than I am. There's nothing in between there. <laughs> My mother thought that she was a, that she was having a tumor. You know, <laughs> when she was 40 years old. She was actually she, you know, 40 years old. She thought it was a tumor. She went to the doctor. The tumor is a guy named John now. <laughs> He's a peach. <laughs> you probably should be interviewing him. He is really a dilly. Did he serve at all in the military? Did he? Oh yes, he went in the Air Force after he got out of high school during the uh, um, Vietnam War. Okay. Now, did your father serve at all in the military? He was in, in the First World War. He was in a machine gun uh, battalion. Um, and his job was to carry the, the tripod. When they moved up, he would carry the tripod that you set the machine gun. Mm -hmm. And they call it the mule skinner. And he wrote a home and said that he was the mule skinner and this battalion and my grandmother had a fit. This so they had four miller skinning mules. The interesting thing is that he was there a while and they were, but he didn't go up to the front to actually shoot people until the next day. The armistice was signed on one day and the next day they were due to go up and start shooting. But he, so he never actually shot at, he didn't shoot at anybody else. I guess that's good then. My father's a little guy, he's only five feet four. Oh, wow. <laughs> and he is, is like a little, lot of little people, he is very, uh, I don't know what you call it, very sure of himself. <laughs> he fights at the drop of a hat. Mm -hmm. Many times he's threatened to take, put his hands on me, but I told him, don't do it. You know, you're sorry if you do. <laughs> Um, here. So what was your most memorable experience while you were in the war? Well, in Algiers, I went through a building out the back door to the Cosmo, which is what was off limits to military personnel. Mm -hmm. And while I was there, they were, I would call it slave and sale. Beautiful young girls. The younger, the purer, the better. And these little codgers were talking to the era of it. I didn't understand, but I saw the girls and I saw the fellows bidding, and so I think they would just buy them for slavery, white slavery. What can I say? That was very exciting, especially when I wasn't supposed to be there. When I went to, we went to uh, Salerno, Italy. Salerno. and the other thing, the other place. At any rate, we got the wounded right off the beach. They felt us right in to bring them out on barges, LCTs. That's loading, you know, something might, something tank, and they go up and get on the beach and run around and shoot each other. And they come bring them out to us. We take them off of the off the, the boat that they brought them out in and put them to bed and take care of them. We had a lot of surgery on the ship. We had several very good surgeons on there. One fellow's specialty was taking legs off. 
you had to be very careful if you had a bad wound on the leg, if they weren't, they didn't treat it, take the leg off. And while I was on the ship, I met a, a fellow that got the Medal of Honor. What happened, he was a volunteer to be a medic, and a fellow was wounded out there someplace in the field, and he went out to bring him back if he could. And all of the, all the medical corps were uh, white backs with a red cross on it on their sleeve. So very often, and this is one of the instances, the uh, crowds, the Germans, took aim on his red cross armband, fired and shattered his upper arm. He took, took his jackknife and amputated his own arm so it was all shattered amputated it, took a roll of bandage, put it under the stub, and held it down to the stub of his arm, then went out and got the wounded guy and dragged him back to the, to the safety, back where the rest of the, Lord's, the, rest of the soldiers were. And uh, I'm glad he got the Medal of Honor, and I think he more than <laughs> I agree. Oh, he was a, he was a great guy. And he would, he didn't brag about it or anything. It was just a natural thing. You go out there and have your arm shot off, you know. <laughs> you come back. I don't know. I don't know if I could do that or not. You never know what you can do till you have to do it. Yeah. What else you got in your mind? Well, I was just, do you remember what his name was? The fellow with the, with the arm shot? No. no. I didn't know. I don't. Not even sure I knew it at the time. But if I did, I would have forgotten it. Right. Because at my age, you forget a lot. Right. Now, um, I also wanted to ask you, where were you, and what were you doing when you found out that Pearl Harbor had been attacked? I went to the movies. The old Strand Theater in Hudson Falls, which is where the town clerk is now, uh, up to almost to the Methodist Church. Mm -hmm on the other yeah, yeah, street. And I went to the movies the afternoon when I came out and talk was about the attack on Pearl Harbor and that uh, I don't know whether it was Arizona or the Oklahoma had been sunk at that point. And I had friends on both ships that had uh, enlisted sometime before the before we went into the war. I don't know, they were, they were recruiting. I think that the high mucky box in Washington knew that, was, that we were going to have war. By glory, we did. It was, it was one of those things that, it's the last good war we've had. Since then, the wars we had have, have been more of a nuisance than anything else. And, um, and there was a guy who was pretty in a war. And what happened to him? This guy here? Oh. The guy who went by. Oh, okay. Oh, I didn't know somebody was behind us. <laughs> yeah, you went by. Okay. That was Dan, that right here. I'm pretty sure he's the one who's prisoner of war. We had another fellow here. Who's um, his name is uh, Sonny Sagan, and uh, <laughs> he died to tell you a story. He, he was a, uh, he went in as a uh, gunner on an airplane, and uh, they were shot down. His leg was quite badly wounded, and he was taken to a prisoner of war camp. Now, how he got out of there, I don't know. He probably was traded for his, for some more soldiers from Germany that we had captured. But this old guy is 88 years old, and he loves that just his war stories. And he tells them over and over. <laughs> but he is a great old guy. Some people can't don't want to sit with them when we 
because he thought so much about himself. He's been an alcoholic for quite a number of years, but he's been off of the booze now for 50 years, and on the anniversary of his getting off the booze, uh, of getting off the booze we had a party. <laughs> and I was one of the ones that was invited to his party. I think there must have been 40, 50 people there. He's a great old guy. If you go by it to get him in, he'll give you a read the real stories. Well, I might take you up on that. Um, now, um, do you also remember um, how you felt when you found out that President Roosevelt had passed away? Uh, I thought Roosevelt was a very divine president. And, uh, I knew he was sick, and I wasn't surprised, but he died. Um, I, I missed him because he amounted to something. We haven't had any really great presidents since Roosevelt. Eisenhower wasn't bad, and he had the right ideas, but uh, never got it. He told people what, what he thought was right, and that it wasn't followed. Um, I think he told uh, Truman, uh, stay, out of, stay out of wars. Uh, they went to uh, Vietnam, just anyway. But the, I don't know how politically minded you are, but this last war in, in uh, Iraq, Terrible. Terrible for a country. We've lost respect in the world. We've also lost billions of dollars. And see, I you know how many men had been killed. I heard it escapes me. Well, I, I heard there was a lot. And of course, a lot of them have been wounded. And they're still being wounded. And now they're stuck in Afghanistan. We can never get out of there. There's no way we can get out of there without uh, egg on our face. Right. And I, um, I have a lot of people in my family are, are military oriented and got some cousins serving over right now. So I, I kind of agree with you. Uh, um. So, um, let's see, sorry. Um, were you ever in battle? In combat? No. no. We were a hospital ship. No. And uh, when we were out in the ocean, we were all lit up okay. with spotlights on us and on our big red cross on the side of the thing. A submarine, German submarine, did come up and went all the way around us. And we wagged something with lights. You know, and, um, one of our, see, the, the boat was run by the Merchant Marine, and we were the medical detachment. And one of the Merchant Marine officers got out there with a flashlight, <laughs> set up a message. <laughs> and then they left. They, they didn't do any harm. They didn't board us or anything. They just wanted to look at us. We had to be very careful because we were flooded. We're sailing with all the lights on at night. So, if you're the light, the, the ship, this young lady comes across, she puts the light out, and then you can tell there's a boat going by. So they had to be very careful about that. So we didn't travel with any other ships because of that. Mm -hmm. It helped the other ships to stand out so that they could compete with it. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's, the hospital ship was a, a great invention. Um, it was a, truly a hospital. You know, it wasn't just a, a first aid station. But, that's not the guy I'm looking for. <laughs> it, uh, it was fully equipped. We had uh, Big surgical unit, uh, 
We had uh, first aid stations on there. I had them. Um, had a motor with a refrigerator, of course. I had, I had worked for an undertaker at one point, and uh, the son of the undertaker was my best friend. And so I had seen a lot of dead people that didn't shock me. So I used to get a chance to go and watch them do an autopsy, which is, <laughs> which is pretty, <laughs> pretty exciting <laughs> to see them do it. I can read a book about the things I've seen in the operating room or in the morgue. What sort of things did you see in the operating room? Well, they operating on people. Um, they take off an arm or a leg if they're badly shot up. And if they're shot up someplace else, like, oh, say, I hit in the chest, they have to go in and take the bullet out. Sewed up nice and neatly. We put wound powder in there, which is uh, one of the salvas. Because I didn't have penicillin when I first went in, and I got that while I was in. But they patched the people up. And we, we, I mean, I think, I'm trying to think how many people we actually had in our hospital. I said, it seems to me that it was in the vicinity of 300. Pretty sure it was. Too bad, <laughs> too bad we can't get get uh, um, Sonny Ed here. Sonny, <laughs> he loved to talk to him. <laughs> really, really. We can set that up if I... It's, it's, sure. You know, I'll talk to Mr. Ozell and we'll probably get somebody back in here to talk to him. Well, if you'd like to talk to me, it's very interesting. You can do it yourself instead of... And what's his name? Um, Ozell. He's the one that's behind this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, this, this old guy is he's amazing. He's a little Jewish man. And in his room, he's, he's not very tall, so he can't put stuff up on the wall. The room is almost completely covered with pictures sitting on the floor. I have been commendations. He's been commended many, many times for being a prisoner of war. And, uh, God, you said everything. <laughs> Why does the sunny come down, <laughs> ride around down here? <laughs> and he just loves to talk about what he saw and did. The first thing he'll tell you is that he was an alcoholic. And uh, he quit. Pulled her again. Uh, going to AAA. AA. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, Healthy now. He literally already weighs 105 pounds or something like that. Yeah. He's really little. <laughs> but he's healthy now, anyway. That's great. Um, so, what did you do um, after the war? Well, I came come back home. It was necessary. They have to give you your job back. I was working for the Imperial at that time, but later became um, mm -hmm. the name of the place. You come down Quaker Road, you know, when you come down to Quaker Road, you have River, or Warren Street, I guess they call it. That was all factory in there. You never know what anything is was in there. And they can't sell the land because of the chemicals in the soil, because they would be, they'd be sued. Yeah. If somebody got a sore finger from the uh, or anything else by them from the chemicals in the soil. What was the Imperial? What did they, they sell to them? Imperial was an interesting outfit. They used to make wallpaper, and the, then they started making color for their own wallpaper. So their color division, hmm, well, I was very nosy. Um, they made their own color, and I did this before we went in the service. I worked in the wallpaper mill. It's, it's a complicated job to make wallpaper. It's got to be made so that 
when you put those things together, they match. You know, you can't just slap the paper on the wall. It has to match with it. You pull off what you want and hang it. Then you like take another piece and it has to match perfectly. So I went back there and frogged around, decided that I wanted to go to college. Well, I had graduated from high school, but I didn't have enough of a major in any subject. So I went back and I took all the science they had to offer, except biology. I had already had biology, and I had only had algebra. So I took all the math they had and all the science they had, and I did so much better than when I was in my high school. And, and what was that high school? Was it Gunsfalls um, no, Falls. Falls High School? Yeah. Okay. And there's nobody left that was there when I was at once. It's 50, 60 years ago, almost. Right. So naturally, nobody around. It, it wasn't too long ago, though, that somebody had, I think it was a woman, had hung on and hung and hung and hung and didn't retire. She, she probably stayed longer than she should have. Mm -hmm. So then, um, when you went to college, um, what what was your what did you study? What was your your major? Um, I had a, actually I had a double major: uh, sociology and psychology. But uh, you had to declare. One, one major, so, so I declared psychology, and I had a philosophy minor. Okay. It's very interesting. Philosophy is interesting. You, you, you don't get paid much for being a, <laughs> a philosopher. Yeah, I understand. I'm studying psychology. Are you? Yeah, that's my major. Yes. Where are you going? Is it safe? Um, no, I've sent out um, some applications. I'm um, just waiting to hear back. So, but I'm studying to be a psychologist. Where are you going? Um, I don't know yet. Um, I sent out a few applications, and I'll know soon, though. Well, I'd love to. Hmm? I'd love to know what you write about the, the article you write about our interview. Just to show me what's important to somebody else. <laughs> This is all, it's all very important to us. Um, yes, they can sit and talk about it all day long. That would be amazing. We'd love that. Um, oh, I wish Sonny would come by. Oh, sorry, I wish he'd come by. They could talk your ear off. <laughs> He's a good friend of mine. Mm -hmm. I love to have him sit at the table where we're eating, or I'm eating. Mm -hmm. And uh, some people feel he talks too much. And he does. He repeats himself. He's 88 years old. I mean, he's a sick man. Yeah. He's got the old age problem, just like I have. I suppose I do the same things he does. They talk about me, probably. It's like being in high school all over again, isn't it? Well, it's different. It's different. Um, I taught fifth grade myself when I was teaching. And uh, I see fifth graders, and I, you know, I know how big they are. But now that I'm out, I look at the fifth graders, and God, they look like little kids. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they were, they're the same, same size as the ones I had. That was fun. Teaching was fun for about 20 years. After that, it became more difficult. Kids were becoming more difficult in the grade school. We had just dozens of kids who wore makeup in the fifth grade. I'd send them down to wash their face. Uh, I wouldn't let them sit in class with eyeshadow on and blush. You know. <laughs> I'd send them to wash their face with a paper towel. They'd come back. If it wasn't clean, I'd send them back. I was mean. I said to them, <laughs> kid said to me, my mother doesn't care if I wear this. I said, but your mother's not here. I'm here. 
and you're too good looking to wear all that junk on your face. <laughs> Very unhappy with me. That's okay. I wasn't teaching to make myself popular. I was teaching something useful, I hope. If I could go back now, I'd be a much better teacher. But I'm not going back. <laughs> I've already had 27 years of it. Now, um, while you were teaching, is that where you met your wife? No, I was, after I got out of the service, I worked at Imperial for a while. And then they had a big cut in personnel up there. And I went, <laughs> I was going to Arizona for the winter. Just hang out, do whatever odd job I could. Well, I got to Albany and I met a friend of mine from high school. And he was, he had a little boy, and somebody had to stay with the little boy at night. He was a medical student, and he was going to be working nights, and he, he, somebody stayed with Jeff. So I stayed with him for three or four weeks. And he said to me, why don't you get yourself a job, make some money while you're here? So I went to General Electric in Schenectady. I was living in Albany. I went to Schenectady, GE, and I worked 30, 30 33 months. Then the, the Vietnam War slowed down. They didn't need all this stuff. We did a lot of government work. Um, and uh, so they laid me off there. And I fiddled around. I saw an advertisement in the paper for social worker uh, to go around and visit people on relief. And I saw this thing in the paper, so I applied for it, and it never, they never interviewed anybody else. And I worked at that for almost a year and decided I'd go back to school. I took uh, four courses on Saturday, two one semester, two the next semester. And then I transferred to St. Lawrence. That was a good experience. I thought. Yeah. Probably the best of Wales would be bored stiff. <laughs> now, um. I, I keep looking. I'm hoping that Sonny will go by. If he does, I'll go on collar. You'll get, a, you'll get an interview like nothing you've ever seen. Now, um. Where did you meet your wife? In church. In church. Um, I was um, I was in my early thirties when I went with General you know, Electric, and they had a thing called the Young Adult Group, and you had to be thirty-five or less to. Uh, Some of our waitresses. There's Sonny. You want me to get him in here? Oh, um. You don't have to be in here. Oh, no, no. Um, I can come back later because um, we've only got one tape. Okay. Um, but I will definitely, I'll, I'll definitely come back and interview him um, at another time. You want me to go ask him if he wants to be interviewed? Um. I'll see him at dinner. Sure, sure. You know, what? ask him at dinner. And then um, I'll give you my phone number, and you can give me a call, and, and we'll set something up. <laughs> that will be a real interview. He is something else. He just he's sitting in a wheelchair somewhere. Okay. Okay. Well, you just asked me something, and I never got around to answer. Oh, um, when you met your wife. Oh, um, she was uh, she was married, and her husband found a. Uh, somebody else that he liked better. Uh, in my opinion, the girl that he took off with was a tramp. And uh, my wife was, she's so much little. She's not really big. And he found a woman who had a tremendous build. 
she really got into Randall's Grove. And after they were married a while, she started to gain weight. And when we, our oldest daughter got married up at St. Lawrence, in one of the, one of the classrooms for the reception room, and we saw the little girl that he had taken off, and she had gained weight. And I was thinking of that. Um, and how many children did you guys have? I have none of my own. My wife had three step, three children, mm -hmm. so I have three stepchildren. And of course, most of my friends thought I was insane for a woman with three kids. Um, no problem. They're really great kids. Really great kids. That's another old story. Okay, time. <laughs> I'll tell you all almost anything you want to know. <laughs> mm -hmm. but, you must not tell anybody we went and swam oh. after the senior ball. I will. I will make sure that, that that's taken off. I'll remember. <laughs> Some of the people around town, and there are not many left mm -hmm. of us that graduated in 42. Not many, mm -hmm. but they would be embarrassed if they, somebody knew that they had went swimming in their underwear at <laughs> this senior ball. I had fun in high school. What else could I tell you? I'm not sure. Do you have anything, any other um, strong memories about when you were serving? In the service? Mm -hmm. um, but the whole thing was, yeah, I look back on it, it was exciting. At the time when we were doing it, it was a pain in the neck, of course. But uh, I had fun. I had a lot of fun. But. Uh, When I was sick, I was the hospital ship, I was useless. And so uh, they wouldn't even make me a first class private. And I got back and said, after you're in for I think a year or two, if you haven't screwed up some way, you can automatically be made a PFC. They made it, all that does is make five dollars a month than you were getting anyone. But because I have, I had this poor record of not being able to be helpful, uh, they, they never would raise my rank to private to private first class. Uh, when I was working in the dispensary at the hospital, I was doing a good bit of the work. And my corporal was in charge. He didn't know his arm from his leg. He was useless. He could put band-aids on, he could give shots. But anybody could give shots. You know, oh, you know, I haven't heard anybody with you know. so we had We had a whole company. We'd come in one day and line up and we give all of them a cholera shop, a shop for example where they went overseas. So we were busy there. I, would, I loved working in this country. I sewed up a little girl once I had torn her behind. She had slid down a roof and she caught her butt on a, a nail. And she was terrified. I rigged up what I call the catheter bandage. You take a one-inch tape and fold it and stick that on both sides of a cut and sew the tape together. Pulls it together nicely and uh, doesn't hurt. Doesn't hurt a little when they put alcohol on it or something to clean the wound up. Mm -hmm. 
she said in the presence of this, this the purple she says, I want the other doctor to see me. I was the other doctor. Buck, buck, buck <laughs> <laughs> All right, what else would you like to know? Huh? Um, did you stay in touch with um, any of the men that you served with? Uh, as a matter of fact, no. Because when we bought the hospital ship, a whole bunch of us came off and we were all over the United States. I didn't mention I had never had basic training mm -hmm. because I was already a first aid instructor when I went in. Right. And so they put me right on the ship immediately. Mm -hmm. It's useless. They didn't know how useless I was going to be. I was, when I tell you, you turned green from being seasick. They didn't mm -hmm. get so on the subclavians, and mm -hmm. they actually do get that blue or something. Yeah. So it's, a, it's the worst kind of sickness I think there is, except maybe if you can smoke. Right. So where were you when the war ended? In Charleston, South Carolina. As a matter of fact, I was on guard duty that night. We had to pull guard duty occasionally, and I was on guard duty. Um, I don't know, somebody came down from the guard house, the guard compound where the prisoners were, and said that they had just declared the war is over. And, well, what's that going to do with me? They said, oh, you'll be discharged sometime. And, Obviously, it was. That was a great relief. It's, it's inconvenient to be away from your home, your family, your friends. Not much money. And every all the money I had, I spent. That was I was in Seattle, and, and that's a very interesting city because. It rains almost every day. See, the wind comes here from the Japanese current and it goes over the Cascade Mountain. As it goes up, of course, it cools and it rains almost every day. On a day like this, you see people walking around with a raincoat out and an umbrella under their arm. You're in the sunshine. Mm -hmm. And in 15, 20 minutes, it, it could pour. Um. How do you feel, um, who are your feelings towards the enemy today, like towards towards Germany? And um, how do I feel about Germany now, or Iraq, or Afghanistan? Um, any, um, any of our, our enemies that, that you would think of. Never have gone to Iraq, ever. And we, and uh, our president, President Bush at the time, didn't have any reason to go. He pushed it, and the three guys that were running the country. Uh, Vice President, um, my mind slips. Um, Cheney? Cheney at the time? Dick Cheney was the Cheney, vice president? Cheney and Rumfeld and uh, there were three of them. They were actually running the country. Bush was not bright enough to run to, uh, the country. This other thing I did not want. Cheney. I can't think of the names at the end of the day. But anyway, uh, I was very much against the war. I was one of the ones that, that uh, walked downtown uh, every Saturday morning with a sign on the day. And another veteran for peace. But once they actually started sending men, I stopped wearing the sign. 
we've got to support them now that they're there, but they never should have been there. I don't think we'll ever be able to get out of Afghanistan. They don't have the right kind of soldiers to keep the peace. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be there for a while. I would guess no less than 12 more years. And of course, not only is it, I feel sorry for the Afghans and for the Iraqis because they're being killed by their own people. And the ones that are not bombing them, the, the Americans are, are killing. And they kill them just to get rid of them, I think. I'm very much against it. But we're there, we've got to get out. Uh, you know, I don't think we can get out of uh, Afghanistan in less than 12 years. Now, um, did you feel the same about Germany? No. Uh, we were attacked by the Japanese at Pearl Harbor. Uh, but, um, I mean, did, did you feel the same sentiment towards um, the German people, the German prisoners um, in the camps? Uh, I, I worked with prisoners of war in Charleston uh, when we were getting ready to leave, and uh, they, we, we, we worked in the, uh, the dump where all the junk was, and we were getting rid of the junk, and we found, we found an old uh, crayon, and we played with it, got the motor started, we used to, we were two kids, uh, we were driving this crane around, we thought, oh, here we go. <laughs> I got playing with a spirit, spirit pistol, that's the one that shoots up the air and it gets a bright light, it looks like, uh, like uh, fireworks. And that's, it gives light at night then, they fire this thing up in the air and it, and landed on the roof <laughs> one of the barracks. <laughs> oh, heck of a <laughs> They never found out we did it. They, mercifully, I'd probably still be there <laughs> if I found out. Oh, we had it. I won't tell anyone, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> I have a whole bunch of anecdotes, but I'll be flat, but not make a good report in class. There's a fellow aboard ship, his name was Alfred, Alfred Kelso, Kelso Jr. And um, he came back uh, when I did, and he worked in the hospital also. And we took such, so we were both patients in the hospital. We heard, we heard a woman a nurse cup, and he grabbed me, pulled me over on a, on a bed, and holding me down, and he was from Maine, he had Maine accent. So the nurse said, what's going on here, what's going on here? I said, Kelso, so I said, well, I'll tell you, we're as queer as three dollar bills, but I'm a lot worse than he is. <laughs> you don't need to tell it that <laughs> either. That's known as um, uh, privileged information. Okay. I'll remember that. <laughs> Why are you embarrassed? Oh, I'm not. I'm, Your face is getting red. I get like that all the time. I can't help it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what else? <laughs> um, but what, what, what was your name again? Uh, Elizabeth. Elizabeth. I have a daughter, Elizabeth. But, uh, right, right, of course. Um, so, um, do you find it difficult um, in any way to watch um, war movies or, or documentaries I today? I do. You do? I do. I do. Watch war movies like uh, um, what was it? Oh, oh, Metal Jacket. Mm -hmm. That is an English. Yes. Uh, I wouldn't go to see that. Um, 
Seen picked up off the beach and brought up to the hospital ship. And Sherman, during the Civil War, it said, War is hell. And it is. It's not funny. It's, there's nothing romantic about war. It's awful. That's my opinion. <laughs> it's a good one. I, I agree with you. Good. I don't get a chance to talk to young people much anymore. I used to see them in church and had a um, high school uh, group back in the service in the Sunday school class. And, uh, I had, uh, I, I was president temporarily of a young adult group in Schenectady, and uh, during that time, my, well, my wife, husband took off with this other girl. So I met her actually at the young adult group, and um, we didn't hold around very long, but got married. I was ready, and she was unhappy. My first marriage, and she didn't think I would pull the studs of her first husband did. One of the things that happened before he died, he died not too long ago. He told Helen, he says, I realize I didn't have any reason to leave you. And I had no reason. It's nothing that you did. Because I did it. And I pulled up. The first thing I heard was saying anything. Sensible. You know, if she doesn't say anything, I was dead. The head, the head of the recreation group just went by. He <laughs> probably wasn't what I'm doing. Um, I just have um, one one final question for you. Um, so, uh, what do you, what did you think about um, Truman's decision to drop the atomic bomb on Japan? Uh, the war was almost over. We were winning anyway. It wasn't necessary to fry a thousand people, more than a thousand, more than two thousand. More. Uh, we were winning, it wasn't necessary. They probably saved some American lives, probably. But uh, in another month, I think we would have been. We'd been asked to accept their, their uh, surrender. So. I really feel we should not have dropped the bomb. But in all honesty, it didn't save a few American lives. And they were still fighting. They were still fighting in uh, what's a place just south of Japan. Iwo Jima. Another island of paper. Um, so they escaped. But we were doing very well. We were going to win. There's no question about that. And then they probably saved, saved some American lives, but they devastated the Japanese uh, civilians. It's awful. If you've ever seen pictures taken, but, uh, both uh, Nagasaki and the uh, um, place they hit first. Did they hit Hiroshima? first? Hiroshima? Yeah. yeah. So they really didn't have to kill all the civilians. I'm very concerned that the civilians have been sacrificed 
in Iraq and Afghanistan. I'm sorry to interrupt, but this tape has two minutes left. Okay. Right, you run out of it. The tape is running out. Yep. <laughs> well, Let's see what it looks like. <laughs> sure, of course. Um, and if you want, I can, um, would you like a, a copy of the, the tape later? Because um, Mr. Ozell can, he has a, a thing that, that'll let me record onto a, a disc, and then you can have a copy of the interview as well. It's like that. I guess I don't get it. You sure? I'm sure. Okay. Well, thank you so much for talking with me. Oh, it's not a problem, lady. Your hands are still cold. I know. <laughs> I wish something could